It is so lovely to see you all. Thank you for being here. Um, how many of you have been to one other session? How many of you have been to two other sessions? You guys are amazing. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, it, I, so I'm in part going to say thank you to those of you who have been to more than one session, although they do not build from one another. And I'm so glad to have absolutely everyone here. I shouldn't say they don't build from one another. They're all distinct in, um, and you do not need to go to one to make sense of the other. However, I hope for those of you who have been to two or three, you're starting to see some connections across. Um, I also want to apologize to those of you who have been to a previous session because now I'm going to say something I said in the last session that I realized is an important way to preface um, the work that we do in, or the work that I do in professional development. I worked in K through 12 schools for a long time and in those settings, um, I went to a lot of professional development and then I led a lot of professional development and facilitated a lot of PD. And you hear a lot from teachers, I want the PD that's gonna give me something in my hands when I leave that I could use tomorrow. And I get the utility of that. But I also find that really dangerous thinking because it doesn't suggest that you're going to professional development to really change your thinking, right? If you're going to really change your thinking, we know that conceptual change takes time. And so I hope um, what I've tried to do, and John has been so instrumental in helping me think about how to do this with this series, is to make sure that I'm both giving you tidbits of things that you might be able to change in your class next week or on your syllabus for next semester, but then also maybe planting some seeds and laying the groundwork for thinking differently about teaching and learning. And who knows when um, those seeds might yield some fruit, <laughs> but I hope at some point they do. So that's my sort of caveat for why perhaps you won't be walking out of here with lots of activities that you can do tomorrow. And I hope you recognize that that's, that's purposeful. Um, but I hope maybe there's something you could do tomorrow. <laughs> um, I, today we're going to, I'll start with just an overview of motivations or what do we know on the research about motivation as it relates to learning. We're going to talk a little bit about helpless and mastery orientations. Um, we'll talk a little bit about problem and project-based learning. Uh, which has been one of the ways in which we've really instrumentalized in pedagogical design, some of the things we know about motivation. Um, we'll talk about theories of intelligence and we'll connect all of these pieces. And um, with each piece, I'll do a little bit of lecturing and then we'll either do a little activity work or group discussion after each segment. Um, as a reminder, Please ask me questions throughout as you have them. For those of you on Zoom, um, Julie is on Zoom and she'll let you know, you know, let her know if you have a question, she will share it with the group. Um, this is a little unsettling and strange, but there are what, how many people are on Zoom? We have a few, 12 people on Zoom. That's a little intimidating. Um, but I, twice in the last couple of weeks, I've been walking around campus and someone stopped me and said, oh, I was watching your training, <laughs> so that um, you're out there. And so that puts a little bit of pressure on me, but please be here as much as Zoom allows you to ask, ask questions and contribute in those ways. Um, I also want to recognize, um, hey, Colleen, um, is that great when you walk in late and someone calls you out? I always do that, <laughs> but I'm excited to see you. Hey, Colleen. Um, so I also want to recognize your investment in your own learning, and that's something that Teaching and Learning Commons, we know how important Teaching and Learning Commons is at WVU. And amazingly, for those of you who do annual review and do it through digital measures, they have recognized how important teaching, the learning that we do through Teaching and Learning Commons is. And so John showed me, now this screenshot did not come out brilliantly, but there is a little um, under the teaching category for digital measures, there is a category for teaching innovation and curriculum development. Okay, so you can actually see that here. That's what I'm pointing to here that is completely illegible on the big screen. But it's innovation, teaching innovation and curriculum development. And if you scroll down, you can click on the fact that you did a teaching and learning commons for, uh, PD. And you know, I think it's important not just for you to get credit for pursuing your own learning, but also helping our annual review and other kinds of review committees recognize the importance of this kind of work that we're doing together. Um, so there you go. All right. 
As those of you who have sat through these talks before know, I am a huge fan of these books. They're National Academy Press books. How People Learn was first published in 1999, and How People Learn Too was published this past, I want to say December 2018. Um, I just came from the American Educational Researchers Association annual meeting, and uh, these books are written by committee. And a lot of the committee members were giving some talks on how people learn too and the legacy of how people learn one. Um, these books have been so enormously influential in teacher education and professional development on university campuses. They are written, as I said, by committee. And so they bring together experts on learning and development from a range of disciplines. A lot of what you'll hear today comes from both How People Learned One and Two. The committees made this really important point that these are not meant to stand alone. This is not a revised version of How People Learn One, but it's meant to be complementary. So it updates a lot of the research, um, but then also adds some new perspectives. They are free to download as are all National Academies Press books. Um, so you can download one chapter on motivation. You could download the entire PDF of the book. So I highly recommend them. So in How People Learn Too, we get this sort of overarching understanding of motivation and its importance in learning. Motivation is a condition that activates and sustains behavior towards a goal. And we're going to be talking a lot today about that sustaining, right? So we might all know how to activate a little bit of motivation. How do we sustain it through challenge and difficulty? This is also really important for our work today. Motivation is distinguishable from general cognitive functioning, and it helps explain gains in achievement independent of scores on intelligent tests. So motivation in and of itself matters, right? And so we might include things in motivation like self-efficacy. We know in all, the, if anyone studied self-efficacy, we know that to be efficacious, right, pushes you to do more, to learn more, despite whatever your prior knowledge might be or your orientation to learning that material otherwise, right? Or to what extent we value them, your test scores, right? And your, your, your you know, potential as it's been defined in a limited way by a lot of these intelligence tests. So motivation matters distinctly from these other cognitive functioning features, right? So it really is something that we should, we should think about how we cultivate, right? We wanna cultivate lots of other kinds of cognitive functioning as well, right? But this matters unto itself and can help promote all sorts of learning outside of these typical things that we often think determine learning. Okay, I know this is a lot of text. I've also apologized for being an English major. Hey, Melody. Um, and I sort of fall in love with these words, so I put a lot of them on the page. After all of these sessions, we send you the slides, and that way you also just sort of, you, you see my favorite quotes, right? But let me pull out some of the pieces of this that make it one of my favorite quotes. This comes from How People Learn One, okay? Young children exhibit a strong desire to apply themselves in intentional learning situations. And when we're talking young children, we mean small, toddlers, right? Young children. They also, oh, that should be a they, they also learn in situations when there is no external pressure to improve and no feedback or reward other than pure satisfaction, sometimes called achievement or competence motivation. Children are both problem solvers and problem generators. They do not attempt to solve problems presented to them they not, sorry, they not only, they do, <laughs> they not only attempt to solve problems presented to them, they also seek and create novel challenges. An adult struggling to solve a crossword puzzle. That was me today, it's Thursday, it's the hardest crossword puzzle of the week, if you ask me. All right, they, saw, they struggle to solve a crossword puzzle, has much in common with a young child trying to assemble a jigsaw puzzle. Why do they bother? It seems that humans have a need to solve problems. Now, one of the challenges of schools is to build on children's motivation to explore, succeed, understand, and harness it in the service of learning. Why do I put this enormous quote up on the board, <laughs> right? 
because think about how different this feels than how we think about most of the students in our, in our classrooms. So if we know that this is how we are brought into the world, right, to seek out challenges and to create novel problems and to solve them, what have we done, <laughs> right? Think about the kinds of the tropes that we hear all the time now about our students. And I'm not just talking our students at WVU, I hear this from teachers all the time in elementary schools. They don't, just don't care about learning anymore. They're just not motivated. The motivation isn't there. We know from the research, don't worry, I'm a big soda stream fan. I got you. <laughs> we know from the research on, on people, on humans and on childhood development, the motivation is there, right? And we crush it. <laughs> we crush it. Now, it's not just individual teachers who crush it. It is a system that crushes it. But one of the things we're going to try to do today is think about how we could reorganize the systems over which we have some control, right? To try to actually bring back some of that curiosity, some of that seeking of challenge, um, and instill greater motivation. Okay, so from a whole range of research on motivation, here are some central things we know. People are motivated to develop competence and solve problems by rewards and punishments, but often have intrinsic reasons for learning that may be more powerful than these rewards and punishments. A lot of our discussion today is going to be around this notion of sort of this intrinsic kind of motivator, rewards and punishments that pervade our society. <laughs> and intrinsic motivators and what they look like. We know from the research that learners tend to persist in learning when they face a manageable challenge, neither too easy nor too frustrating. For those of you who have studied or heard about Vygotsky, right? This would be within the zone of proximal development, we call it, right? Not too hard, not too easy. And when they see value and utility of what they're learning. So it's not just that we've found that sweet spot, this isn't too hard, this isn't too easy, but it's also that we've created an environment where students recognize the value in what they're learning. And if we go back up to that first one, hopefully that's some intrinsic value. And you'll see the benefits of that intrinsic value in a moment. We know that children and adults who focus mainly on their own performance, such as on gaining recognition or avoiding negative judgment, None of us are familiar with either of those things, right? Those children and adults are less likely to seek challenges and they're less likely to persist than those who focus on the learning itself. Again, so how are we going to do that? We'll get to that in a moment. Learners who focus on learning rather than performance or who have intrinsic motivation to learn tend to set goals for themselves and regard increasing their competence in and of itself to be a goal, right? They're not, it's not a mechanism for doing something else. The learning itself is a goal. Are you hearing a lot of themes here? So this is looking at scores and decades of research. It's all coming back, this intrinsic interest in learning. Finally, and this is sort of, this is the piece that, that matters for us. Teachers can be effective in encouraging students to focus on learning instead of performance. These are malleable, right? These folks, the, our, our students focus on learning versus a performance. We can change that. And that's one of the things we'll think about today. Okay, so helpless and mastery orientations. I, I can't get away from this study. It's just one of my favorite studies, 1988. And you have all heard about Carol Dweck, whether or not you realize it, because you've heard about grit and you've heard about growth mindset. All of this comes from her legacy of work. And I still think some of the best ways of understanding it come from this 1988 study um, with Leggett. So in this study, you have some children and they're given some tasks. And the tasks are comparable across the children who are in the helpless group and the children who are, or the helpless, I should say, condition, and the children who are in the mastery condition. And the children who are in the mastery condition said, hey guys, you're gonna get some problems and just do the best you can. Just, you know, see how much you can get done, okay? And the kids who are in the um, 
helpless condition, we're told, um, you may or may not be successful. You know, there's a threshold for success and you want to try to hit it, but you may not hit it. So some kids will do well and some kids won't do well on this. You see if you can do well. Then they were given the same problems. And when the problems were fairly easy, they all did great. They did fine. Oh, yes, I'm going to be one of those kids who wins, right, or gets the most. And the other kids are saying, oh, I, I'm learning. This is great. I'm doing what they asked me to do. Then they introduced challenge. Some of the problems got more challenging, right? What happens then? Interestingly, the children who are told, just do your best. Don't worry about how many you get right or wrong. Those kids kept going, okay? And they, they would start talking to themselves and saying things like, you can do this. Yeah, you did the last one. You can do this one. The kids who are told, you may not be successful at this task, right? You need to hit a certain threshold to be successful. They started giving up. And so by the end, well, we'll tell the end of the story at the end of the slides. So here's some things we know about those kids who were in that helpless condition who affected this helpless orientation. It was characterized by an avoidance of challenge and a deterioration of performance in the face of obstacles. And this was promoted by these performance goals that I just described, right? You need to do better than these other kids, right? Or you may or may not be successful. Now the mastery orientation involved the seeking of challenges. Thinking back to when we spoke about young children, right? Who seek out novel challenge um, and the maintenance of effective striving under failure, right? This idea we think about it now is this idea of grit, right? That we often hear about. You keep going, you're persistent, even if it's hard. Now these were perform pr promoted by learning goals, which the individuals who are concerned with increasing their competence. Just do the best you can, just do the best you can. This is about your learning, right? All right, um, I know this is long, but this is super interesting. And what I want you to hear are echoes of yourselves and your students. So these children who were in the sort of helpless condition, right, where they were told, given these sort of extrinsic motivators and told they may or may not make it, these helpless children quickly began to report negative self-cognitions. Specifically, they began to attribute their failures to personal inadequacy, spontaneous citing, so spontaneously citing deficient intelligence, memory, or problem-solving ability for the reasons for their failure. How often have you heard, I just cannot do it, I'm not smart enough, right? So this isn't about, this is a difficult problem, this is about me, I'm deficient. Helpless children pronounced um, negative affect. Specifically, they reported such things as an aversion to the task, boredom with problems, or anxiety over the performance. Again, despite the fact that shortly before, before the challenge had been introduced, right, they had been quite pleased with the task and situation. Oh, this is fun, I'm doing well. And then once the challenge is introduced, you know what, this is getting really boring, or I'm just not enjoying this anymore, right? Yeah. yeah I'm sorry, were, how were the helpless students identified? Was it just based on what they were told? This or? is not, there's nothing about individual disposition here. This is all about the condition. So these were, these, the children in and of themselves, when they came into the experiment, were not identified, no one is identified as helpless or mastery oriented. It's the conditions that created these, these um, behaviors okay, and these. So the, the helpless students were the ones that were told that you, you may not be able to do these or? So when they refer to the helpless children, it's those who started showing signs of helpless so orientation. through the course of it was over the course of the experiment, exactly. And so it was the, no, thank you for clarifying. That's important or asking me to clarify. So again, it's it just, we saw the majority of the students in the task where they were told, you might not be successful here and it, you're only successful if you hit a certain threshold. Those children started showing signs of being more and more helpless and that's who they're referring to as the helpless children here. Um, I know that sounds terrible. It should be helpless children, but it's how they're feeling, right? Um, again, how often have you heard from students, this class is really boring, right? When you say, no, it's not boring. This is fascinating stuff, right? But they have, they have, this is this affect that they've put on. We might think about 
psychological coping or something, right? Where they, um, they're trying to separate themselves from this task somehow. So they've got this negative affect. More than two thirds of the helpless children, but virtually none of the mastery oriented ones, engaged in task irrelevant verbalizations, usually of the diversionary or self aggrandizing nature. For example, some attempted to alter the rules of the task. Some spoke of, ta so this would be better if, right? If you asked me the question this way rather than that way. Have we heard that one, right? Um, some boasted of unusual wealth and possessions, right? Do you know who my parents are? Um, presumably, so presumably in an attempt to direct attention away from their present performance and towards more successful endeavors or praiseworthy attributes. Thus, instead of concentrating their resources on attaining success, they attempted to bolster their image in other ways. I was describing to John, a brilliant student I had years ago, a doctoral student who was having a lot of trouble going through his comprehensive exams. And this was new to him. He was really, really successful in the classroom and came to graduate school to push himself and was having a tough time getting through comprehensive exams. And I will never forget this really difficult moment I had over my desk, right? Working through the comps, trying to get him to push him further. And he sat back and he said, do you know how many teaching awards I've won? It had no relevance to what we were discussing at all. But it was this moment, right? Where he was really just trying to protect his ego. And I realized that he couldn't focus on the work that we were doing. It was too difficult. It was too difficult, not the work in and of itself, but for what it was doing to him psychologically. And then finally, this is the important piece, right? I mean, not that affect isn't important, but the helpless children showed marked decrements in performance across the failure trials. They stopped learning. They learned less. Let's tell the happy part of the story, okay? For these children who were given the same problems and were no different from the outset, from the kids who were put in the helpless condition, right? the extrinsically motivated condition, the performance-based condition, I'm sorry, the um, goal-based condition, you wanna hit this goal, right? In striking contrast, the mastery-oriented children, when confronted with difficult problems, did not begin to offer attributions for the failure. Indeed, they did not seem to believe that they were failing. Rather than viewing unsolved problems as failures that reflected on their ability, they appear to view the unsolved problems as challenges to be mastered through effort. They would verbalize things like, I love a challenge, right? They engaged in extensive solution-oriented self-instruction and self-monitoring, right? You can do this. Let's think about how to do this better, right? They'd say these things to themselves. For those of you who were um, in the session last time when we spoke about metacognition, these are really typical kinds of metacognitive, metacognitive work that we do but that we know helps, right? So these kids who really believed that they could do it and were there to learn the most they could, they just sort of um, spontaneously started doing a lot of this good metacognitive work. You can do it. How can we solve this? They also instructed themselves to exert effort or concentrate and then monitor, monitor their level of effort or attention. And the mastery-oriented children appeared to maintain an unflagging optimism that their efforts would be fruitful. I did it before, so I can do it again. In the end, I won't read through all of this. In the end, the kids who were mastery-oriented, who believed they were there to learn the most they could, big surprise, they learned more than the kids who believed they were there to achieve a goal. Okay, and that goal being extrinsic to the learning itself. So both sets of children were given a test at the end, which is, could be seen as an extrinsically oriented goal. You're learning this in order to be successful on the test. The children who believed they were there for their learning and not the test would have done better on the test. Isn't that amazing, <laughs> right? So it's how we're orienting them. And again, I think back to this really important question. This was not about a certain set of kids were chosen. These children 
on all sorts of measures were the same coming in. It's how we organize the situation. What kind of learning were they doing? You know, that's an interesting question. And while I actually cannot probably tell you from this specific study, I will say creating these conditions have been done across fields and across different types of learning consistently since 1988. And we find the same thing again and again and again across subdisciplines and across different types of um, engagement with or different types of learning within those disciplines. Um, so absolutely, if you look up, let's say Dweck and Leggett, and then do one of those in, in you know, it's, look into their, their searches and look for engineering problems, there'll be scores of literature, I am certain of it. Um, and I can even send you some stuff. Does it start to be very No. From young children through adults, we have done this work. It is consistent. Now, we will talk a little bit about how there's an effect over time of understanding schooling and the structures of schooling, right? So we start wearing kids down and priming them to understand that schools are about goals, the goal of performance and not the goal of mastery, right? And so that has an effect over time. We can still shift it. Um, yeah, so one, two, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That, just an example, I, I did this and I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. Um, the, the, I've taught, the, the course I'm teaching, I've taught, this is the fourth year. And in the last, the first three years, I applied like points to everything. This time I didn't. I applied standards to everything with the total points at the end. That they knew what they were gaining for. I gave them a, a whole transparency thing that said, here's why you're doing this exercise. Here's what I want you to do. Here's the skills and competencies that you should be using when you do it. And here's how I'm going to judge your your success or failure. Yeah. Okay, these are these are the things that will gain you, these are the things that'll lose you, but I never gave them a number. I'm having the best interactions online that I ever had this is in a course. Yeah. This this time they actually are figuring it out themselves. They really are talking to each other. The last discussion, they were even finding extra course resources to throw into the discussion. You know, look at this article, look at this one. I'm thinking, jeez, I wish I'd have done this sooner. Amazing. So first of all, I realize I should have you introduce yourself when you speak. Oh, we've worked together. I know, but for the whole group. <laughs> and I'm Lydia Mong. I'm an Lydia. instructional designer in the teaching and learning commerce. What's it? Exciting about what you just described too, Lydia, is you actually didn't change the nature of the tasks, it sounds like. It was your assessment that changed. And that was enough to stimulate a difference in how they're oriented to your students were oriented towards yeah. learning. Yeah. Well, it wasn't like do this and you'll get two points. Right. And they all of my class passes, they did that and they got their two points, but they didn't get it. You could tell. But they made the points. They got the grade, but they didn't know the stuff. Really. And now you're seeing the shift. That's really inspirational, exciting. I may ask you to send maybe examples of those two rubrics, and when we share out the slides, would you be willing to share, and we could share out those two sets of rubrics or assessment guides? Would yeah, you be willing yeah, to share yeah, with the group yeah. so we could see some concrete models? Sure. That would be amazing. Thank okay. you. Yeah. So hi, I'm Vicki Holcomb. I'm in physics and astronomy. Um, I'm hoping at some point you're gonna discuss what we can do to shift that. Because That's what we're about to do. Okay, great. Okay. Because so many <laughs> courses are, of course, based on tests, and the students know that. Mm -hmm. So how do we reframe that? Yes, and here's one example of just shifting how you think about assigning points or <laughs> talking to students about what the, you know, what the, what the assessment looks like or how they'll be assessed, right. um, which is really powerful. My students always tell me they like pictures, so I drew a picture for them, or I created this picture for them, right? So over here, we've got Mastery Mountain. This is just a sum up of all the stuff we've just talked about, right? And so for the, the goal of Mastery Mountain is this. Get as far as you can, right? And what's the implicit message when we say, get as far as you can, or learn as much as you can? The implicit message is everyone gets to a different point. That's okay. 
And what do we hear? We hear things from kids that might say, I'm not sure I'm going to make it to the peak, right? But I'm learning a lot about climbing as I go. Has anyone ever taken the climbing classes or taken their kids to climbing classes at WVU? This is the kind of thing you see. Like it's exciting to get to the top, but these kids are all supporting each other all like through the whole thing. Oh, you got higher this week than you got last week. That was awesome. That peak looks really far away. But for now, I'm putting one foot in front of the other, just seeing how far it takes me. Okay, this is the kind of orientation we want from our kids, from our students. Then we've got performance peak over there, right? Where it is not about mastering material, it's about performing the mastery of material. It's about performing well. And what do we hear? I reached three summits last year, and I have great hair, right? External, external, or external to the task at hand, right? Well, I can't get all the way there. I might as well quit now. I guess I'm not a good climber after all, right? And these negative cognitions that we often and unfortunately hear from our students. So how do we change this? How do we make our courses and our learning experiences look more like Mastery Mountain than Performance Peak? Because we know, in fact, those people who are oriented towards Mastery Mountain learn more. They get higher. So even though we made the goal different, not get as high as you can, but get where you can, keep going, right? They get higher than those people who say, you either get to the top or forget it. You know, you didn't achieve. All right, so again, the great news. These orientations are not fixed dispositions. They're flexible and malleable depending on the task. And as instructors, you get to design those tasks. So here's the question, to reiterate the question that's already been asked by the audience. What is a task that, provoke, that promotes mastery look like? So for starters, we need to change the goal of the educational task. In other words, we can't just make it all about the grade. Um, I'm gonna skip skip this, but this is back to those major tenets of educational research, right? Which all, all, all discussing motivational research, so many of which focus on this notion of intrinsic reasons, intrinsic motivators. And by creating an intrinsic goal that's relevant to the learning rather than something extrinsic to the learning, right? You promote a more mastery, a greater mastery orientation. So I thought we'd do some small group discussion. We've got a group of four over here. You could sort of organize yourselves as it makes sense. And I want you to think about those contexts in which you are intrinsically motivated to learn and extrinsically motivated to learn. What are the motivators? Okay, that make you what are the kinds of motivators that we see that are intrinsic to the learning itself? And what are those motivators that are extrinsic to the motivator, the, the motivation itself, or the learning itself rather, like points, okay? How do those contexts and activities differ? Can you share any stories of persistence in the face of challenge? And that might be the thing that you remember. I remember this was so hard and I kept going, right? What supported you in those moments of difficulty that oriented you towards mastery, right? What created that environment that made you want to persist? And can you share any stories of giving up? Those are the harder stories to share sometimes. And what contributed to that helplessness? I, was, I drove to Toronto this past week to, uh, to this conference and a friend drove me who is a skateboarder. And he's been skateboarding his whole life. His teenage son now skateboards. And he has the bruises and the scars to show it, right? And he was describing a story of trying to get this trick, this really difficult trick on this complicated set of stairs um, on the university campus. And he described going out every day, from morning to night, every free hour he had. No one else was there, he was on his own. And his goal was to get the trick. And I said, I asked, I said, did you ever land the trick? He said, yeah, you know, once, but man, I will never forget that summer. And in some ways that was the time that really, like it pushed me to see the limits of my body, right? And push past them. And that's what skateboarders do. Now I'm a soccer mom. I watch so many soccer games. <laughs> I love my children and I love soccer, but oh boy, there's a lot of soccer. <laughs> 
And it, I, I could not help but think about how my kids have been taught to be oriented towards soccer. They're both on really competitive travel clubs, right? And I don't know if you've ever watched the game. It started off pretty close, right? Where maybe there was a one goal difference and everyone's still working real hard and trying real hard. And then one goal difference becomes two goals difference. And you see the change in the kids' bodies, right? And you see that they're, they no longer believe it's possible. And then that two nil score becomes four nil <laughs> because they're not trying as hard anymore, right? So right now, these could be classroom-based or not classroom-based, but think about those contexts where you're not motivated, they're not motivated by the love of soccer, becoming better soccer players, right? Or even playing the best they can play. They're motivated by the score. And then think about my friend, the skateboarder, who didn't actually, like he wanted to do the trick, which was intrinsic to the learning of, which is relevant to the learning of skateboarding, but he was just gonna keep going no matter what, because he just loved the skateboarding and wanted to be able to do this trick. So think about those contexts in your own lives, be they academic or not. And think about what were the motivators to keep you being mastery oriented versus goal oriented, okay, or performance oriented rather. Does that make sense? All right, so sort of organize yourselves maybe in groups of three or four, and we'll take maybe 10 minutes to talk and then we'll share out, okay? Let me ask you this question. I always want to hear, and we'll share, we'll share out in a minute, certainly. But let me ask you this question. I always want to hear what's happening in these conversations. I want to walk around and I want to listen. And I stop myself. Why do I stop myself? How does it change the nature of your conversation when the presenter starts standing over your shoulder? <laughs> right? Are we measuring up? And it changes how you feel, and maybe changes the extent to which you share. Now the goal, part of the goal might be, am I performing all right for the person who's giving, you know, facilitating the professional development? So it's so hard for me to step back and not listen in, but it's purposeful, right? And sometimes there may be utility to it, but I have found in these contexts as well, as in particular, it, I think it's sometimes counterproductive. You're often encouraged to walk around. Right. Yeah. So in part, it seems, you know, well, let me put that out to the group. I have some ideas, but what are people's thoughts? So we also know that having small group conversation, right, there's a lot of reasons to do it. So it's not the same kind of performative work that you're doing in front of the entire class, right? So Colleen might, Colleen's so shy, she's not shy. <laughs> she's very personable. But Colleen might have been that kid who never would have spoken. If I asked the whole group a question, right, and you had to perform an, that answer in front of everyone, Colleen may have never raised her hand. But she has a lot of really important and good things to say. So as her teacher, I may have known Colleen's gonna have a lot to say in this small group, and I wanna make sure I have access to it and I could hear it to know because partly group conversations is a form of assessment. It's a good form of formative assessment. I can find out what my students are thinking about, how they're thinking about the material, and ways that I can then respond with instruction. So what are the things to consider there, and how can you make it so you're not just performing for the instructor when they come over to listen? Yeah, and introduce yourself. So I'm Marianne Downs from Health Sciences. I um, would think it also has to do with what the task is that they're doing. So if they're all working on a particular task or problem, then going around to ensure they're all on the same right track towards answering it may be useful. Whereas if it's to be more um, organic conversation and you would be interfering or impinging on that, that may be as well. So if I set the goal, everyone needs to finish this problem and I need you to finish it correctly by the end of class, right? So they were already oriented towards that goal, right? Which is finishing the problem versus, I want today for us to just be a chance of thinking about whatever the phenomenon is, right? So let's just like really explore this idea. So the teacher over your shoulder in those two different contexts might feel really differently. So it's not just about standing over you. You also, for the most part, don't know me, right? But if I were in a class where I had regularly set up 
that performing well in this class is not about getting the right answer, but is about engaging deeply, right? Or is about regularly building from the texts, or is about honoring one another's ideas, right? If we had built that up over time, um, we spoke a lot in the last section about how you respond to people, right? Colleen, this is, this is why you don't want to like go into PD with the person you know, right? Because you're going to, if Colleen, if I ask someone to, you know, to answer a question and Colleen just got the wrong answer and I said, Colleen, tell me a little bit about your answer there, right? Tell me a little bit about how you came to think that six is even and odd, for those of you who've been in previous sections, right? Where we had Sean start out class and say, I've been thinking about six. I think six is even and odd. And what resulted was the most amazing discussion of mathematical argumentation that you could ever imagine third graders having, right? The teacher never said, that's crazy, Sean. We, what even or odd, six class, six, uh, even. All right, it's even, it's even, no. Huge, lovely debate that showed lots of mathematical reasoning. Colleen says, I think six is even or odd. And we spend an hour and then actually keep referring to it for weeks and weeks about six being even or odd and how we're figuring that out. And if I regularly say, Colleen, thank you for putting out a really interesting idea that we've really had to wrestle with. I so appreciate that. That might make the students feel differently when I'm standing over their shoulder. That they know I'm not there to see if they're right or wrong. Are you posing interesting problems? Are you supporting one another's learning, right? But in this context, I haven't set up that rapport with you. You don't really know me. So that's sort of, we talk actually later in the, in the session about language, about the kinds of things you say, right? And so we can also, over time, prompt that kind of rapport where I'm looking to see how you're supporting one another's thinking, right? How you're honoring each other's ideas, how you're pushing each other to think differently rather than getting the right answer. But you don't know me well enough right now, right? You might just think like, oh, am I talking about this correctly or not, right? And she's going to be judging me or seeing if, you know, whatever. Does that help? Maybe. Yeah. So, Melanie? Uh, Melanie Page, Psychology. We were having a discussion around, and I don't know if you'll talk about this, but required versus non-required courses and, and then size of the courses. Like, and I was just thinking when you were talking, like the, the kind of, like I wish I was in your classroom like every day. I'm just going to come to your classroom because it seems very supportive. <laughs> Some <laughs> what days. a space to be in. Um, but this idea, right, historic, like Oxford and the great book schools sort of seem to teach in this way, right, by these small groups and you discuss things and you learn together, right? Uh, some of the, some schools don't have grades, right? You just get a transcript of, did you learn stuff? Right. Um, but we've really kind of taken both K through 12 and uh, undergraduate education and made it like a mill, right? We were talking about somebody's got 150 students three times a week or two times a week and you're just milling them through right we're milling them through a system and we put all these different requirements that make no sense to the student or even to what the student wants to do with their life and so how do we how do we begin to change any of that i know my that well, melody i don't want to tell you the answer to that one. um we can't deny that we live in a society that is not, does not help us orient ourselves towards mastery. And yet there are people who are oriented towards mastery or there are moments and contexts in which we are more oriented towards mastery. So I spoke at the beginning about what can you take from this? And it may be that at the outset, you can think about changing one activity or you can think about changing the nature of some of the activities in an elective course or a seminar. And that 150 person lecture, because believe me, I have that lecture too. And I think about these questions all the time. And because it's a class on learning theories, I'm regularly saying, don't do what I do. <laughs> this is bad, you know, according to everything I just told you, this is terrible, right? So in some contexts, this is far more challenging. And ultimately, 
we are, um, this is systemic, right? This goes well beyond, why are our students here? Are they here to learn or are they here to get a degree? Just that shifts what they do here, right? I've had some really fascinating discussions with colleagues who teach in honors college and they thought it would be fabulous. These are kids who are already motivated, but not all motivation is equal. Who are the kids in honors college? Those are the kids who have learned the game of school. They've learned how to be successful and they know how to get good grades. And that's always, that's been the way they've been successful. And so some of my colleagues who have become faculty fellows in Honors College were so excited to really get to engage their students in deep learning. And they found it was more challenging than their non-honors courses because these honors kids were generally really, no matter what they did, right? they were generally more, they were primed to be oriented towards these grades. So it meant more undoing than they had expected, right? And I think that's, an, that's the, actually an, in, an issue having to do with these different orientations towards motivation. Um, so yeah, I can't answer that question, Melanie. But I think, as I said at the outset, some of these things, hopefully you can think about the way I'm gonna change how I assign points, how I talk about points and grades right, versus uh, maybe that, that's the extent of it in a large lecture, um, versus some of the ways we could really think about restructuring the work we do in class, which is what we're about to talk about, um, in maybe a smaller setting at the beginning. Um, I will say that even in my large lecture classes, I think about these issues of affect. So I, I think I shared this with you if you were in the session last time, that after every assignment, no matter the class, even if it's the 150 person lecture, when my students turn in an assignment, I make them write a cover sheet. And on that cover sheet, I say, what do you need me to know about this assignment, about you doing this assignment? You know, um, well, I ask them these metacognitive questions. Tell me about what was hard. Tell me about what challenged you. Tell me what you could have done better. Tell me what I could have done better in my GAs to help your learning. And then I always remind them, what you've just turned in, I know, and the GAs know, is not the best product you ever could have created. This is what you were able to do in this moment, in this context, right? You may have had three other papers last week that were due, and I know that, and so we recognize that. So I just reinforce their thinking away from having to convince me that they're really smart or they're really capable. I remind them that this piece of paper, this, you know, this assignment does not represent who they are. So that's not getting at the core root of the problem, but it's certainly recognizing the problem and trying to address it. Um, and so a lot of them tell me about the three other papers they had or the breakup of their boyfriend that they had. I'm not really interested in those details, but I want to give them an opportunity to let me know that. Um, and it makes it eases the pain sometimes of pressing submit on a campus, you know. Yeah. Do you find that your students who are those performance oriented and gotta get straight A's are very uncomfortable with this change? I've had doctoral students in advanced seminars tell me to just tell them how to do it. <laughs> in methodology courses, research methodology, just tell me how to do it. <laughs> that's not how it works, <laughs> right? But that's how they've always been successful. Um, and you, it's a lot of work to undo that. And again, it feels counterintuitive to have your most successful students, according to all measures, according to that transcript, be the ones who have the most difficulty with really getting deeper. And I actually think, Colleen, that's a really good, ooh, I'm all hooked up. All right. Um, I think that's a really good point because it, are the, it sometimes is these moments of surprise, like with honor students or super advanced students, but there is a shift. And I don't know if anyone who regularly teaches undergrads or who teaches undergrads and graduate students have found this shift where there's this like drop off that happens between a 200 and a 300 level class or a 300 and a 400, where it's no longer to be successful. You actually can't just keep doing the things you've been doing all along. Now you need to come up with a new idea that other people haven't had yet. You have to argue subjectively rather than regurgitating information and memorizing information, right? And 
some students have done really, really well up until that point, and then you see this drop off. And I think motivation has something to do with that as well, right? We think, great, you're at the point now where you're able to come up with some ideas that reflect your own curiosities. We have not been supporting that thinking all along, and we don't understand why they were doing getting hundreds on all the tests before, and now they're being less successful. A lot of it has to do with how we're motivating them. So I want to. I want to show you because you've been asking like how do we operationalize this i want to show you some examples now some of these are examples from k-12 through classrooms and i know those can be frustrating but a lot more of this research and design work has been done in k-12 classrooms i will also show you some examples that relate to higher education and then we'll have some opportunity to think about what this might look in higher ed okay so way back when when dweck and leggett were doing this work Roger Shank, and I got to say, having Melanie over there from the Department of Psychology sort of makes me a little bit nervous about talking about all my old psych, psych heroes, but Roger Shank was doing work that builds from these ideas of motivation, and he came up with this idea that he called a goal-based scenario. What's a goal-based scenario? A goal-based scenario or goal-based scenarios are problems in the, domains, in the domain of a student's interest that present definable goals and encourage learning in the service of achieving those goals. Where do these goals come from? The student's interest. A GBS, goal-based scenario, is a type of learning by doing task with very specific constraints on the selection of material to be taught, the goals the students will pursue, the environments in which the student will work, and the tasks the student will perform, and, the resources that are made available to the students. We sometimes think, you know, that if we give the students more autonomy, it takes some of the work off of us. Often it's the opposite. It's actually a lot easier to just tell the students all the things they need to know, right, than to have them construct it themselves. And certainly it becomes even more difficult if we're asking them to construct knowledge in line with the domain that reflects their own interests. So we have to create a scenario, right, where the students are figuring out what about this field, this sub-discipline in which I'm taking your course, really interests me. What questions might I have that are relevant to me that are relevant to this course, to this discipline? And then it's incumbent upon us as the instructor to create a learning environment that supports them in this. Though I can hold it off to later. Awesome. No, no, go for it. So, in my physics class, which is normally very problem solving based, mm -hmm. I have them do a two piece uh, movie review where they pick some movie scene, I don't care what, and they do some calculation related to the stuff we're learning in class to determine whether it could really occur in oh their life. So cool. yeah. <laughs> and then they have to compare the number that they decide to calculate in the end to some reference to make their conclusion. That is so fabulous. I love it. And how often are these like crazy scenes with projectiles right. accurate? <laughs> <laughs> and how often are they totally improbable? Um, more, two-thirds two of the time they're improbable. Right. But there are some that they realize that oh, actually that, that was okay. Who are the good directors who have studied their physics and know that it could work? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> are you curious though? Like who really knows? Or either just George Lucas or like some crazy sci-fi. Like do they know these projectiles? <laughs> oh, that is fascinating. I love it. I'm thinking about my, my husband who's a historian and how often even my kids now know say like, oh, that would never be what they would wear. Or, you know, there's different ways of assessing. That's brilliant. I love it. That's great. Um, and you have a lot of these elements here, right? So the target skill, you know, is related to the physics content, right? It's related to whatever it is, motion or movement. And I'm going to show my ignorance about physics. The more I talk, so I'll stop. Um, the students have developed this mission, which is to figure out, is this um, realistic or not? They probably have to choose a specific focus within that mission, right? They couldn't look at everything happening in a scene. They have to focus their attention, and maybe they sometimes need your help to do that. Um, 
they create a cover story which envelops the mission. And I'm gonna talk a little bit less about that, but if you follow the links that I have in here, you could learn more about the cover story, which sort of prov provides a narrative for what they're doing. Um, and then they plan their operations. How am I going to figure this out? Okay, how am I gonna figure out what, be it formulas they have to apply or principles of motion, do they have to apply to this scene in order to figure out if it's realistic or not? Um, and you're building this learning environment for the students as they go. Um, so I want to go quickly through, now I said to John when I brought this up for him, I said, everyone's gonna laugh because man, check out this website. This is like a relic of history, this website. <laughs> However, on this website that was developed by Roger Shank before he decided like websites even were maybe, you know, passe. Um, teachers and researchers came up with all these great goal-based scenarios. And they might start with a question like this or a problem like this. Let's say we're studying ecosystems or sustainability. You might start out with a problem like this. All right, this semester we're gonna feed the world. Do we actually think our students are gonna figure out how to feed the world? You know what, they might. <laughs> but what are the range of things that they would need to do to figure out how they could feed the world? What kinds of material in a class on, let's say, sustainability or ecosystems, what knowledge would they develop in service of this goal? And with really carefully built environments in terms of what materials you're able to give them, what support of the learning you're able to give them, how much learning would they do? I hope that our students would be motivated by a problem like feed the world, right? Or the fact is that many people are not being fed across the world, right? So they're motivated by, they're intrinsically motivated. They think this is an important problem. It's relevant to your course, right? And you can think about how do you, over the course, support their learning towards this goal? Right? And this website, as I said, which makes me laugh, but it has so many of these great ideas, right? These great problems, and then sets up all of the supports for each of these problems. Now, again, this is generally sort of K through 12, okay? But actually, I think most of the problems are not K through 12. It's the materials that support the learning towards the problem are K through 12. Um, okay. So, this notion of goal-based scenarios. Goal-based scenarios tend to be project-based. Here's a project I want you to do, right? And along the way, you're gonna marshal all of this information and all this knowledge and all this problem-solving skill in order to be able to complete this project. We can also, we also in the same vein, think and talk about problem-based learning, right? Where you give someone a really complex problem rather than a whole project and through trying to solve that problem, um, given some interesting resources, uh, students again, marshal and conscript all of this interesting information and knowledge and problem solving skill. So, um, did anyone, when they were in school perhaps, or since, learn to program with Logo, the little triangle? Okay, so Logo, I did too. I remember fourth grade, we learned Logo. It really is uh, very rudimentary uh, programming through MIT. And you got a triangle and you would say things like, I forget exactly, but it was like four word five, right? And the little triangle, it was a turtle. It was a triangle, it would go boop, 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 boop. And then you tell it to turn right, go five and you can make a square, okay? So over the years at MIT, they realized, okay, this has been great for kids, learning, teaching them how to program, right? And what computers do. What if we had, I don't know, millions of triangles? And we could give the triangles different properties, and then we could have kids play around with the properties, right? And it becomes this really cool mechanism and tool for solving complex problems without having to actually go into the world and solve those problems, right? So here's an example. This is the classic example that we see, which is the wolf sheep and grass problem. So if we're thinking about ecosystems, right? So in this system, we have wolves who eat the sheep, we have sheep who eat the grass, okay? And what kids can do is they can play 
around, okay, with these different variables. And they'll say, all right, in my system, I want to, oh, what happened? So in this system, they increase the number of wolves. What did that do? That increase that meant there were fewer sheep. Okay, great. The wolves rule. Oh, wait a second. The wolves rely on the sheep. Okay. And all of a sudden there are no more sheep. And what happens? The wolves die and the grass is safe. <laughs> grass just gets to grow, right? And kids can continue to play around and they could say, okay, what happens? Let's set it up again. And we're going to have less grass in this situation. What happens? And we see, they can start seeing the shifting up. Oh. And things are sort of sustaining. We're seeing the ebbs and the flows. And you can go on playing like this, okay? So this one sort of makes sense to most of us. We can imagine um, what happens once someone tells you. And we don't actually have to perform the experiment. We don't have to go out and plant some grass, throw some sheep out there, throw a few wolves out there, see what happens, right? <laughs> um, we can sort of imagine this one. But if we are going to ask students, especially in our classrooms, to tackle more complex problems that they can't always play out in experiments in front of them, NetLogo becomes this really fabulous tool for helping them think about the parameters um, and solve these problems in different ways. And so NetLogo is all free. Ori Walensky and others at Northwestern University have created this website where it's also crowdsourced. And so people create these awesome problems um, and create the parameters for these problems and then share them out. Um, and so what's exciting when you look through is this one is a cool one for social sciences about voting. Um, and they show, um, but you can change, um, the, oh, this one's a rumor mill. So these are all social science ones. Traffic segregation. I've seen this one actually, it's really interesting. But if you go through, there's complex ones having to do with the ozone layer and global warming. It's, they are math-based, they're science-based, they're social sciences. There's a language one having to do with how many people around you speak what languages and what that does for language development, okay? So it's a tool for helping your students solve problems that might be interesting to them and giving them the resource to do, resources to do it through technology that we may not have the time and resources to do otherwise in a course. Um, I'll show you this one on, on uh, real quickly on, um, it sometimes has trouble. It, it takes a very, it takes a, a rather powerful computer. Okay, here we go. Um, so percentage similar people around you versus um, and number unhappy, okay? And you play it. To really pose problems that might be interesting them, to them in relation to your domains, right? And then play them out. And this isn't the only way, but that's so often the problem I hear from faculty is like, yeah, but I don't have the resources to do this, right? If it's a small science lab, maybe, but if it's a big social science experiment, right? How are we gonna do that, right? Sociologists study that with lots of numbers. And we put in a lot of data to actually be able to have this be a tool to help us do some of that interesting problem-based learning. Okay, so. Um, Cornell has done some beautiful work on their website, sort of laying out the parameters for problem-based learning and what, um, and how you can set it up in your classroom so that could be really successful. So problem-based learning is a student-centered approach in which students learn about a subject by working in groups to solve an open-ended problem. There's some really beautiful work on the nature of problems and how problems are structured. Um, and I'm not going to cover that material now, although if people are interested, I'm welcome to send, I'm happy to send you some um, research related to it. Um, but we know that generative problems, meaningful problems that produce a lot of learning, tend to be open-ended and tend to be unstructured in that it's not really obvious what all the parameters are. And by having these unstructured problems, students end up working harder to solve them and again, marshalling more information and more problem-solving skills. Um, and so a good problem here is an 
open-ended problem where it's not obvious what all the pieces should be. Um, like the problem of feeding the world. We haven't even said what the parameters are, right? Except that people need to be fed. We haven't said sort of what the variables or constructs within that problem are. The students need to figure those out. That sounds really different than saying, okay, you have this much food, this much water, this is your population. Solve this problem of making sure everyone gets fed, right? Um, but these more generative problems tend to be really open-ended. The problem is what drives the motivation and the learning rather than teaching relevant material and subsequently having students apply the knowledge to solve problems, the problem is presented first. This sounds really different than what we're used to as well. So think about the typical structure of classrooms. Here's all the information you need, right? These are the relevant formulas. Here's the relevant background. Okay, now apply what I've just given you to this problem. Not only have we not really challenged the students as cognitive, cognitively as much as we could there, it's an inauthentic problem. How often in the world do we get problems where we know all of the parameters? And we're really constraining the kinds of work that students are going to be able to do when it comes to problem solving, right? We talk about this idea of problem solving skills. What does that really look like? Well, we might say that one of the things students are doing when we're developing their problem solving skills is they're figuring out what do I need to know in order to solve this problem? Not how do I take what my teacher just gave me to solve this problem? Those are two really different kinds of tasks. Um, and so the idea with problem-based learning is you start with the problem, not with all the information you think they need. And they come to realize, this is what I'll need in order to solve that problem. So taking your awesome example, showing them the, again, I keep thinking projectiles and war, but you know, okay, like so, or a cool battle scene and saying to your students, how would we figure out if this, this would really play out like this? And again, rather than having first given them all of the formulas related to motion, having them figure out what would we need to know? What's relevant here about the arc of this projectile or whatever it might be, right? And then that's harder work for us as instructors. We need to be a lot more responsive. We need to have this like arsenal of material but then it also becomes more authentic for us as we engage in the learning community to say, huh, what would we need? What can I give you to help you understand that? Or what are the ways in which we can figure that out? All right, I need to think about that too. And I need to do some exploration. So these are, again, Cornell, I put the website down on the bottom, uh, but Cornell has done a beautiful job of really laying out what these problems can look like. And I thought we would take a little bit of time, maybe about 15 minutes to do a little work where we create a problem-based learning project. And we'll start off, and I want you to think about a course, and maybe it's not your enormous lecture course, or maybe it is. <laughs> and you take the material there, and you say, what would this look like? Okay, so think about the goals and the objectives of one of the courses you teach. And you're not gonna think about all of those goals. You'll think about one set of goals. Articulate the learning outcomes of the project. What do you want students to know or be able to do as a result of participating in the assignment? Create the problem. What's a problem that you think your students will care about that'll be relevant to your learning goals? Ideally, this will be a real world situation that resembles something students may encounter in their future careers or lives. Cases are often the basis for project-based learning. I had a professor in graduate school who um, he taught kids about understanding the environment and he was in some schools and these kids did not understand Tell me if I told you this example already Kids didn't understand why their parents and grandparents gardens wouldn't grow in their neighborhoods And they would in some other neighborhoods in town. This was in Chicago And so they created a database and they had kids taking soil samples all across Chicago and sending them in to this central database and looking at the pH levels and then they continue to look further and find out 
what was the percentage of salt versus sand that was being put on the, this is Chicago, right? Put out on the roads um, during winter and um, how that was affecting what was growing. And these kids were really motivated by this because they were hearing from you know, their families like, oh, we were trying to grow tomatoes and the tomatoes won't grow. We have this community garden, nothing's growing, right? Um, and they found out that there were real reasons for that. So think about all of the things that these kids were doing. These were elementary school kids relating to statistics and gathering data, right? As well as understanding the relationship of pH and soil and what that means about growth, right? So this is a problem that the kids cared about and it was related in this case to the environmental science um, learning objectives that this school had. We wanna establish some ground rules at the beginning to prepare students to effectively work in groups. We might de-emphasize that today, but you might be thinking about that. You'll introduce students to the processes, okay? You'll consider students having taken different roles. So the very first workshop we had together, for those of you who are here, we talked about disciplinary authenticity. And you might think about what are the different roles that people take when doing work in our field, right? Are there some people who are the um, project managers, some people who are the data collectors, some people focus more on the analysis of data, some people focus more on the write up So you might think about what are the authentic roles or kinds of jobs that we do in this field and how can we help that structure the problem and help students learning. Um, and then you establish how you'll evaluate and assess right and this goes back to sort of what are the kinds of things that you're listening for when you're listening to a conversation what are the kinds of things that we've we're telling the students we're going to assess them for we're looking to see how you all contribute how you support one another's roles right how much outside information you're able to find and bring in we'll figure you have to figure out how it relates to your learning objectives, what you want to assess. So I thought we would take a few minutes to share some of these ideas that people have come up with. And I will say the thing I always say, these do not need to be perfect. You've only just started thinking about it, right? So in part what you're doing when you're sharing the seeds for an idea for creating a problem-based um, learning environment or experience for your students is you're just sharing the seeds and maybe you'll hear from other folks about how you could think about fleshing it out um, or actualizing it. Um, but I asked, I asked a couple of folks to, to share who I heard from, and then if anyone else wants to share, Colleen, do you want to start us off? Sure. I teach a course um, on assistive and instructional technology for young children with and without disabilities. Um, and we touch every developmental area, functional skills in AT, math in AT, literacy in AT. Um, and what I thought about doing was setting up four or five developmental disabilities um, with an emphasis in say emotional behavioral disorders, cerebral palsy, things like such as that. And groups of three or four would get together and start working at the beginning of the year. Um, I would have them rotate through their roles. Mm -hmm. Each one would serve as the parent for one of those child, the teacher for one of those children, occupational therapies, whatever related service providers. And as we went through each of our course lessons and they gave that information, they would then start working on, okay, we're developing this type of um, early intervention plan for the child. What kinds of assistive technology did we learn about? What barriers might this child have? How can we help the child get over those barriers? And it would be a successive project that was throughout the semester so that when they were finished, they would actually be able to say, okay, I know what to do with in my classroom. I have a child with these types of disabling conditions. I know what type of assistive tech supports. I know what a parent's concerns might be. So this way we kind of bring the whole semester together. That is lovely. Yeah, do you want to? Oh, no, no I, I just had a question. Are they, yeah. and I might have missed it if you said it right off. Are this, are they going to have like a child with this certain condition, like each group's going to have their own different child or? They're going to have a selection of um, four or five case studies that represent some of the major disabling. When a young child is first up until the age of five, they're covered under developmental disability, but many of them have a primary disabling condition, but it's just the way the law covers up to five. So they would have that opportunity of saying, well, I really want to know if I have a child with cerebral palsy, how would I work with that child in the classroom? And that way, as we go through, say, um, assistive technology and early literacy skills, 
they could delve deeper into two of the types of supports that might be required. So it's thinking about multiple roles. It's thinking about this problem. I use problem this way, not problem in reference to the disability. Um, in multiple contexts mm -hmm. across the semester. So you're also asking the students to really be connecting things the way they will authentically be asked to do once they're in the field. Really lovely, yeah. I really like it. One thing I might suggest is allow the students who want to, to pick which scenario they're most interested in. Mm -hmm. Right. And then what? maybe fill in the others for the students that are, don't care so much. Okay. Thank you. Would you mind sharing yours and tell everyone your name sure. as well? My name is Rob Rogers. I teach trusts and estates to law students. Uh, trusts and estates is basically where your property goes when you die and how to send it to where and to whom you want. And the problem-based learning project I have for them is to develop an estate plan for themselves. And my thought is that when I did it, I had research, I gave them five or six pages of resources. Here's what it should look like. Click here for more information. If you're gay, click here. I mean, all sorts of extensive details on things you could look up. And I'm wondering if that may have inadvertently frustrated the learning opportunity that if they're told you need to develop an estate plan, then they have to sort of figure out a little more for themselves. Uh, what do I need for an estate plan? It does replicate more of the real world situation where someone with a financial life comes into the lawyer's office and then the lawyer has to figure out, all right, what do they have and where, where do they want it to go? And so anyway, I'm not sure I have a certain answer on that, but it was a counterintuitive realization that by giving them more information, I may have been frustrating a, a learning opportunity. And think about that student in that moment of reading all the information. I mean, you, kept, you probably kept saying, you'll be using this for a project later in the semester, right? And they're working through this reading, doing it because my professor told me I had to. Because they're not motivated by that problem yet of creating their own estate plan, right? But if you give them the problem first, and they really start thinking about what are the range of things I need in order to develop this. And oh yeah, this actually matters because I will have to do this one day, right? Then as you're giving them those materials, they have a new motivation for understanding them. That's intrinsic to the problem that they care about, right? So you could see how that really shifts. Those are lovely. I'd like to move on because I have one more small topic that I'd like to cover. And I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I hope this got you thinking about maybe some small pieces that you could change in a course or some big pieces, right? What I love uh, about Colleen's is it's threaded across the semester. So a lot of the major touchstones of her, of her teaching may not change, but there's this one piece that's threaded across, right? Or in this case, it's one of the projects and it's sort of flipping the order of, of how information is presented. I do wanna warn you, I wanna provide one caution. Some of the pushback around the literature on problem and project-based learning relates to contextu overly contextualizing information. That I think that we know that one of the ideas about presenting information without a context. So for those of you who we talked about apprenticeship, cognitive apprenticeship last, last um, workshop, when we think about a traditional apprenticeship model, Right, when you're learning how, I always use shoemakers, I don't know why, I must love shoes, but when you think about that shoemaker, you know, the shoemaker who learns how to reapply a heel to a soul in the context of that happening, someone bringing them the shoe, the heel has fallen off, how do you fix that? If you then ask them to extrapolate over the years of their career, some of the principles about design or principles about manufacturing from that problem that they kept having, the fear is that they may not be able to do it, that it's too highly contextualized, they can't extrapolate from that one scenario, right? Versus if we just give you principles of design, repair, and manufacturing, as we might imagine we do in classrooms rather than through apprenticeship, you'll be able to apply them to any context. 
In reality, that's not happening either, right? So if you just get generalized principles, we don't think about how they, we talked about transfer last time, transfer to context. So what's the solution? It's something in between. And actually going back to this example that Colleen presented of having multiple cases over the course of the semester, what we know is if we continue to push students' thinking and learners' thinking around certain ideas in multiple specific contexts or problems, right, or projects, then they are more readily able to extrapolate and become really flexible with that knowledge and develop that flexible expertise that really is the hallmark of an expert. So it may not be enough to do this one time. It may be something you have to think about multiple moments during the semester, each time looking a little bit different um, in order to make sure, to ensure that that knowledge can be extrapolated and isn't just embedded in that one small context. So that's the word of caution. Okay. Now I'd like to talk about theories of intelligence, which Dweck and Leggett and others have shown are connected to these notions of orientation towards problems and motivation. Okay, so back to the good old DNL, Dweck and Leggett. They identified these theories that learners and really all of us have, uh, we're all learners, but children and all of us have about, about intelligence. Children who believe that intelligence is increasable pursue the learning goal of increasing their competence. Whereas those who believe that intelligence is a fixed entity are more likely to pursue the performance goal of securing positive judgments of that entity or preventing negative judgments of it. So here we're recalling that orientation towards performing or being, or mastering some learning, right? Being uh, focused on the learning itself. And Dweck and Leggett found that there is, that people really have these theories related to intelligence that either you are smart or not, or that you can increase your knowledge, right? Get smarter. Um, it's either innate, fixed, or malleable, able to increase. And that if you tended towards those um, beliefs about intelligence being malleable, then you tended more often towards, you're more likely to be oriented towards a mastery orientation, a learning orientation. I will never forget teaching this several years ago in a class for teacher, for prospective teachers, okay? So this was a class for students who were learning how to be teachers, you know, in the teacher education program. And we were describing these ideas of a malleable or a fixed notion of intelligence. And a student raised his hand in a 115 person lecture, right? It has to be sort of bold to do that. And said, now I get what happened to me freshman year. He said, I was a gifted student all through school. I had a G next to my name, and it made me think that I was gifted, and my peers who do not have the G were not. And then I got to college, and it was really hard. And I thought, oh, they were wrong. I was never gifted after all. I just fooled someone at some point with a test. And so he said he became really unmotivated to learn because in fact he'd been fooling everyone all along he actually wasn't capable of doing this hard work of becoming a teacher right or of going to college and he said this explains it i had been taught that intelligence was fixed because someone fixed the g next to my name whereas if someone had said you've been really really capable right you've been really pushing yourself and learning a lot and that's great this is about to get harder right? But if you continue to work hard at it, right, you will continue to be successful rather than just thinking of it as like a switch that turned off. And that was such a powerful story for me and how it related to sort of back to Melanie's point that we are working within a whole system, right? We cannot just, we can maybe control a little bit of what happens in our classrooms, but we recognize we've got a lot of kids and a lot of people in the world running around thinking my IQ is this, right? Or I had a G next to my name, or I didn't. 
right? And that means something in a fixed kind of way. But unfortunately, those theories of intelligence affect how we learn. Um, do I have time for this? No, I don't have time for this, but you can, again, we'll pass out the slides. Um, this was a piece in The New Yorker um, that Malcolm Gladwell um, had written where he built from some more recent work that Dweck did, um, where they were looking at English language learners um, at an institution um, in uh, Hong Kong, University of Hong Kong. And those students who uh, they found, they offered some extra help in learning English. And those students who had a very fixed notion of intelligence were not signing up for the extra, is free extra help, right? Because there's this idea that I can't fix it anyway. And I need to also, there's this element back to preserving one's sense of self, right? If I sign up for this, people will think I'm stupid and I need extra help, right? So I'll let you read about it and you could follow the, the link to the New Yorker article, but it's really fascinating. Um, and I'm gonna move on, but this is more, more discussion of, um, well, you know what? This I am going to read to you. This is how we help to shape theories of intelligence. And this comes from how people learn too. Praise received after success influences students' later achievement motivation, but perhaps not the way it was intended. Mueller and Dweck conducted two studies in which students received praise for their performance on a reasoning test. Some students were praised for their ability, well done for being so smart, and others for their effort, well done for working so hard. Students who received praise for ability were more likely to adopt performance goals on a subsequent test, whereas those who were praised for effort were more likely to adopt mastery goals. Further, when given the choice, a higher proportion of students praised for ability chose to examine a folder they were told contained average scores of their other test takers, rather than a folder they were told contained new interesting strategies for solving similar test problems. In stark contrast, less than one quarter of those praised for effort opted for performance information. So even though these might feel like sort of ingrained theories of intelligence, something as simple as the language we use around our students, around intelligence or performance, can shift these things. Um, and some of you may have read this lovely, I don't know if people are familiar with Khan Academy, free, amazing educational resource. Um, and Saul Khan wrote a, a really lovely um, uh, uh, blog post about how he talks to his son and how so often we're used to talking to our kids, you are so smart. I can't believe how well you're doing at school. It's great, you are so smart. He said, I will never tell my child, he read a lot of this work. And I said, I will never tell my child they're smart again. You know, that promotes this idea that it's an entity. And the moment that they don't do well, they become helpless, right? Because I'm no longer smart, so I don't know what I can do. Rather, you are working so hard towards this goal. I am so impressed with how hard you are working, right? How you really tried out multiple different approaches to solving this case, you know, until you got the solution. All right, gosh, you wrote four drafts of this essay before you turned it into your teacher. I really, really appreciate your regularly trying to, you know, do better and, and continue to put forth that effort. Um, so you can follow the link on your own time. But I'll leave you, we don't have a lot of time for discussion. We have about five minutes left. But it's worth thinking about the kinds of things we do to attribute a fixed notion of intelligence to ourselves or others. How often do you hear things like this? I'm just no good at math right? Which is this very fixed notion of, that's it. I'm no good at math. Other people are good at math and I'm not good at math, which is I've always struggled with math. Where in order to use math in my everyday life, I find I really need to work hard. That sounds really different. And other people hear us talking like this, like our children or our students, right? About what kinds of things do we attribute a malleable notion of intelligence to you or others? Things like math, right? Or is it skateboarding that we say like, oh yeah, this is something you could learn at any point in your life. It's so fun. I don't know if it's skateboarding or <laughs> something else, right? What language do we use to suggest these ideas? And how can we change this language in particular with our students? 
around the kinds of comments we give them, around the kinds of exchanges we have in the classroom. Again, when, when Colleen got that question wrong, according to every standard, but it promoted 35 minutes of great discussion, that is praiseworthy. Colleen, I love that you keep bringing up these hard problems that really make us wrestle with learning as a class. Thank you, right? That really changes how we're all oriented in this class. All right, connecting all the pieces. Unsurprisingly, as I've suggested, these different kinds of mindsets and goals and theories of intelligence tend to be aligned, right? So if we are performing when we are learning, we tend to be more likely to be helpless when we engage with the challenge, and we're more likely to see uh, intelligence as an entity, an unchangeable entity, right? If we tend towards thinking about intelligence as something that is malleable, we may tend to be more likely towards thinking about our goals as mastering material and information and learning right? And we, um, and we continue to grow and are more likely to grow and persist even when challenged. Um, this also comes from how people learn too. There's a lovely chapter that cites a lot of fantastic research if you want to pursue it further. Um, and so this is the small group activity that we don't have time for, but you've started with this second task, right? Of considering what problem and project-based projects could look like in your field. I think it's also worth considering the myths about intelligence that abound in your field, right? Are these notions, are there some notions that some people get it and others don't, right? If we think about the humanities and the arts, is there an idea that some people are naturally creative, right? And others aren't, um, or some people are just good, have good computational skill, therefore they're able to do these kinds of things where others don't. Right? So what are some of those myths that we may need to be really, really conscious about undoing? Well, I, think, and so not, yeah. I guess maybe it's sort of like natural ability versus hard work ability, right? And then, yeah. <clears throat> so this is like, uh, let's say I wanted to play basketball and the women who play in the WNBA, right? Like no matter how hard I work, I will never be as good as them. Is that sort of what you're trying to get at? Where, so how do, how do you, okay. And so I think maybe then the argument is, had you started working as a five-year-old towards building up your running, towards building up your jumping, towards building up different things, then you might have prepared yourself for being in the WNBA. But or this, like like my friend who sits there and sketches for hours and hours and hours well, where they find it entertaining. The practice, but there's a so biologically height you can easily point to right and say there's a limit on height I can't make myself taller, or if I wanted to be a gymnast I can't make myself smaller. So let me change that. Yeah. intelligence that's in your brain, right? Like right. And so that. for just in in part just because of time because it is one o'clock now, I maybe like to it's worth changing the the purpose in those scenarios. If I'm teaching basketball, my goal is not for all of my students to become NBA stars. My goal for my students is to push themselves to learn the most basketball they can and to feel good about learning. And one of the ways to do that is to feel that they have potential in basketball, to enjoy basketball, to be self-motivated, intrinsically motivated to learn basketball. And my students will be more successful learning basketball than if I start out saying, some of you are going to be successful here and some of you are not, right? So there are, whole, as at the very first slide we said, there are a whole range of factors. Motivation is one. And this is one that we happen to know, the reason John and I selected it for this topic is it happens to be malleable. It happens to be something that we can change. I cannot change how tall my students are if I'm teaching them basketball, but it can change the ways in which I motivate them to learn basketball. So that's why it, it's worth learning. And yeah. the motivation might, in the long run, create an ideal basketball coach as opposed mm. to an ideal basketball player. That's a lovely point. I will provide one last example, and I shared this with John earlier. When I started, my husband and I started graduate school around the same time, and he tells the story of sitting in rows with the program director in front of them, 
and the program director says, look to your left, look to your right. One of those people or you won't be here next year. They were right. I think about my graduate program, my doctoral program, he would deny it, but an equally prestigious university. <laughs> and um, we were sitting around a table and our program director said, look around this table. These are your future colleagues and collaborators. Start those relationships now. Figure out how much you can learn from one another. And indeed, these are still some of my dearest friends and greatest collaborators, okay? We all were just as successful potentially going through. We had all the resources, similar resources, right? But how are we oriented towards our programs and the people around us? That was set into motion by things that were told to us, right? So I'll leave you with this. I'm sorry, we didn't have more time to do some of these activities, but I think some of the activity work that I saw happening was, was meaningful. And I hope that it's generative. I hope that you're able to bring it into your courses. I really appreciate all of your time. As I said, we'll send out the, um, here's some more illustrations and discussion, a bibliography. Um, we will send out the slides from today um, to all of the participants online and in person. Um, and if you continue to have questions or thoughts or are interested in an article about this or that, just send me an inquiry and let me know and I'll, I'll be in touch. Thank you all so much.